On January 21st, 2017, millions around the world marched to promote legislation and policies supporting women's rights, among other things. The main event was in Washington, D.C., known as the Women's March on Washington. It featured over half a million people and was the largest political demonstration in D.C. since the anti-Vietnam War protests of the 1960s and 1970s. The Women's March is evidence that feminism is alive and well. And just so we're clear, feminism is the belief that men and women should have equal rights and opportunities. Feminists who protest think we're not there yet. But how did feminism begin? Obviously, in this video, I will tell you, and I'm going to have a little bit of help from my new friend, Sammy, from US 101. Be sure to check out his YouTube channel. It is quite amazing stuff. Most historians agree that the modern feminist movement began on July 19th and 20th, 1848, in Seneca Falls, New York. It became known as the Seneca Falls Convention. Organizers advertised it as, quote, a convention to discuss the social, civil, and religious condition and rights of women. Okay. So that was a bit grammatically incorrect, but you get the idea. The convention's two main organizers were Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott, who became friends eight years prior at the World Anti-Slavery Convention in London in 1840. Stanton had earned a reputation as an influential activist for years, known first as a leading abolitionist and then later as a leading proponent of women's suffrage. Mott was known for the same, but also for being a powerful speaker and a Quaker, a branch of Christianity strongly tied to many of the major reforms of the 1800s, like the temperance movement. At that anti-slavery convention, the men forced the women to sit in a separate area. This really upset Stanton and Mott, and the two talked about the possibility of starting a women's rights convention. Flash forward eight years later, and Stanton was now living in Seneca Falls. Meanwhile, Mott was visiting her sister, Martha Coffin Wright, in nearby Waterloo. When Mott and her sister went to hang out with Stanton, along with Mary Ann McClintock and Jane Hunt, the five of them had decided that the time was right. Five days later, the Seneca Falls Convention took place. It was the first women's rights convention in history. There wasn't a lot of people there, mostly because it wasn't really advertised that well. Of the 300 in attendance, 40 were men. While the Seneca Falls Convention featured some lectures and discussions and all the usual convention type stuff, the most famous contribution was the signing of the Declaration of Sentiments. Elizabeth Cady Stanton mostly wrote the document, modeling it after the Declaration of Independence. It summarized the injustices women regularly encountered and offered 11 resolutions to give women equality. Over two days at the convention, the leaders of the convention read and debated these resolutions. For more about what was actually in the Declaration of Sentiments, I'm now going to turn it over to Sammy from US 101, who has been patiently waiting for me to stop my yapping. Thank you much, Mr. Beat, and uh, no, no, you weren't, you weren't talking for too long, and uh, you were uh, seriously, no, you were doing, you were doing great. Anyway, guys, let me start off by saying that I am not a historian, but neither are you. So, how about we, the people, learn this stuff together? My name is Sammy Jerush, the host of US 101, a weekly show about American history, and uh, let's dive into this document. So the Declaration of Sentiments, as Mr. Beat said, modeled itself after the Declaration of Independence, but not just in structure. The document actually took whole passages from the Declaration of Independence and reworded them to highlight the importance of women. For example, Jefferson's declaration says, quote, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation, 
end quote. Declaration of Sentiments takes that same passage and rewords it to say, quote, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one portion of the family of man to assume among the people of the earth a position different from that which they have hitherto occupied, but one to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes that impel them to such a course. In fact, one of the most famous lines of Jefferson's declaration, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, was changed for the Declaration of Sentiments. Stanton added the words, and women, to that phrase. Now in Jefferson's declaration, there's a section of it called the indictment, which essentially is a list of grievances against King George III. Imagine the first version of Festivus, if you will. Stanton does the exact same thing in the Declaration of Sentiments. There's also a section known as the indictment, but instead of going after a king, it goes after the men of America. For example, some of those grievances include the following. He has not ever permitted her to exercise her inalienable right to the elective franchise. He has compelled her to submit to laws in the formation of which she had no voice. He has taken from her all right in property, even to the wages she earns. He has endeavored in every way that he could to destroy her confidence in her own powers, to lessen her self-respect, and to make her willing to lead a dependent and abject life. In Total, there are 16 of these sentiments listed and none of them pull any punches. To be frank, these ladies were not around. Now finally, Stanton's declaration closes with the following message. In entering upon the great work before us, we anticipate no small amount of misconception, misrepresentation, and ridicule. But we shall use every instrumentality within our power to effect our object. We shall employ agents, circulate tracts, petition the state and national legislatures, and endeavor to enlist the pulpit and the press in our behalf. We hope this convention will be followed by a series of conventions embracing every part of the country. The Declaration of Sentiments was signed by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, Marianne McClintock, Jane Hunt, Martha Coffin Wright, and a slew of other women that appeared at the convention. And some men also signed the Declaration of Sentiments, one of which you know very well. Frederick Douglass was also in attendance. And in addition to signing the document, claimed that the Declaration, as well as the convention as a whole, was a, quote, grand movement for attaining the civil, social, political, and religious rights of women. And on that note, guys, I'm gonna send it back over to Mr. Beat to close out the episode, but I do hope that you guys check out US 101 and subscribe to the channel if you're so inclined. You can also check us out on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. And on that note, I am all done. Mr. Beat, I will see you when I see you, my man. Thanks, Sammy. Great job, uh, but watch your mouth. I've got kids watching, all right? I want you to just go ahead and go wash your mouth out with soap, okay? Uh, now, but anyway, weird fact. The Declaration of Sentiments, no one knows where it is. I'm not joking. The original copy of it has been missing for a while now, and you can follow the hashtag FindTheSentiments to keep up with the efforts to locate it. And yet, it remains one of the most important documents in history. More people sign the Declaration of Sentiments than sign the Declaration of Independence. The Seneca Falls Convention kicked off the modern women's rights movement. 72 years later, women would finally get the right to vote everywhere in the country with the passage of the 19th Amendment. Of the 68 women who signed the Declaration of Sentiments, only one lived to see this happen. And today we have come a long way, but around the world especially, we still have a long way to go. Take Saudi Arabia, for example. Due to religious customs there, women can't drive, they can't swim in public, and they can't even compete in most sports. Hopefully that will change soon. Until then, feminists continue to fight. Be sure to check out Sammy's channel, US 101. He does a great job of taking American history and making it extremely relevant to today, and he's really funny. So thanks, Sammy, for helping me out with this video. I'll be back next week with another episode of Supreme Court Briefs. Hey, thanks for watching.